morning, everybody. All right. Okay, it's interesting to look back on one's journey and see who inspired you and what inspired you and how those things are going to inspire your journey in the future. I'm a marine biologist and more specifically a reef fish ecologist. And right now, I'm in the middle of my journey. And today I'm going to share with you about my journey, what I've learned, how I got here and where I'm going to in the future. My research interests revolve around trying to understand the patterns of fish communities across large spatial scales. That means continental coastal margins or island chains. And why large scale patterns? Well, it's for two reasons. Firstly, most of our research is done at much, much smaller scales, less than 100 kilometers. Therefore, there's just the need. Secondly, the human-induced impacts that we, we create on our oceans are large. Climate change, global warming, ocean acidification, and the effects of historical and current overfishing. They occur at large scales, thousands of kilometers. Therefore, we need to collect data at the scales to match these impacts. My work has led me all over the world diving on coral reefs and temperate reefs, and it's a job that few people get to do and certainly get paid for. But at the same time, I'm burdened by the knowledge that what I'm seeing while I'm diving on these reefs is not as what it should be. Okay, so we all know the numbers. We've seen some of them today. 80% of our world's fisheries are overexploited, depleted, or recovering from overexploitation. 73 million to 1 million sharks are taken annually, depending on who's counting. And largely, these are put in shark fin soup. And less than 6% of our coral reefs and less than 1% of our oceans are under some form of no-take protection. These numbers are certainly not inspiring. But I didn't start my journey to find this out. It started, I started my journey because the oceans inspired me and I was in awe. It all began when I was around six or seven. And I can link my current place in my journey back to two things and the people who showed them to me. The first thing that got me on my journey was a mask and snorkel. And my folks throwing me in the ocean. <laughs> this is me on my first research expedition. I'm the little guy in the life jacket, must have been pretty rough. You can see me there with my first research vessel, a twin fin foam boogie board. <laughs> and this is where it all began. I knew from this point in time that I'd be a marine biologist. During the weekends, we'd be out snorkeling on temperate reefs in southern Victoria. And if we weren't at the beach, I'd be watching TV, Jacques Cousteau and National Geographic documentaries. And I was completely inspired. So from the simple beginning, I knew I wanted to be a marine biologist to learn more about the oceans and the marine life. So I did, but despite my skeptical career advisor when I was 14, after graduating from high school, I moved to North Queensland, studied at James Cook University and became a marine biologist. While I was there, I became a dive master and got to dive on the Great Barrier Reef whenever I could. But it was evident early on during my career and what I was seeing on the Great Barrier Reef that things were not as what they should be. I'd been led to believe that I would see these great schools of sharks and fish and grouper and snapper through these documentaries I watched. But I wasn't seeing them. Where were they? Was I just unlucky that in the hundreds of dives, I had, dives that I had amassed so far that I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time? I realized this was not the case. It was simple. Fishers were targeting every fish they could find in every nook and cranny, on every reef, on every ocean. Essentially, the fish were disappearing before I got a chance to see them. This sums it up for me. People will say, where have all the fish gone? Where are they? We have eaten them. It's simply a case of too many boats and not enough fish. I wanted to understand the extent that fishing had had on the coral reefs I've been diving on. But I knew we had to look at the situation at large scales. But doing large scale studies were limited by our survey techniques mainly because of cost. It's very hard to train up scuba divers to all, all be expert observers. It's really difficult to write on a piece of paper on the water the number of fish you see, their species name and identity, how many there are, how big they are, and whilst imagining a five meter boundary to your, to your transect. And I was certainly no good at collecting this data. So if I couldn't trust my own data, there must be a better way. So after my time at James Cook University, 
I came across the second object that has defined my journey to this point. And I can credit this to Dr. Ewan Harvey, who after one phone call convinced me to drive from Townsville to Perth and start a PhD over there. Using video cameras was not novel, it wasn't new, but adding a second camera was. And this second camera allowed us to accurately measure each fish we came across. Without this, trying to estimate the length of fish was very difficult. Between us all, if we were to try and guess the length of a single fish, the error between us all could be as high as 30%. And this is just not good data, especially when the fish that we catch are usually the biggest ones. And if we want to see them grow, we need to be able to detect if they're growing. And we can't if our error is 30% or more. So this is me off Rottnest Island in Western Australia during one of our first stereo video um, pieces of equipment. Now we say as marine biologists, it's not technical equipment if there's not duct tape and cable ties covering it all. <laughs> also note the little dangly thing off my leg, that's a shark pod. Some of you may be aware of those things. Um, some say they do or not work. I guess this one worked, I'm still here. Then this is how it looks back in the lab. You can measure big fish and you can measure small fish. You just identify the right fish in each frame click on the head and tail of each fish in each frame and it tells you its length and it also tells you where in space it was. So how did this get me to where I am today? Well for three reasons. One, it removed all observer bias in our data so we can deploy stereo cameras across the world and anyone can use them and we collect exactly the same data. Two, it increases our sampling scope. We basically get more bang for our buck. We can get three to four times the amount of data we can with this than we can with traditional techniques. And so this is where I wanted to go with my research, thinking big. But the ultimate reason was I could trust my own data, and that's important for a scientist. So realizing these benefits, we went on and did a PhD study across Western Australia, and this should have been a map. Oh well. Okay, essentially, Daniel Pauly said, we want to sustain things that are gone. And I'll get to this one and I'll show you the next slide. We surveyed 1,500 kilometres of coastline from Geraldton to Esperance in the southwest of Western Australia. A lot of people live on the west coast, not so many on the south coast. So this is where I went. Each of those balloons represent one of my survey locations. And essentially, I did about 1,344 sampling units within each of those green not within each one, but across all those green balloons. It only took us 28 days of in-water field work, which was not a lot of time. So what did we find out? So apart from finding out some unique ecology things, this is what we found out about the distribution of fish. Don't worry too much about the specifics. This is just the weight of target fish, the fish that we like to eat. On the west coast, you can see there's barely any per meter squared. On the south coast, there's a whole stack. But this is where our current marine protected areas are. And this is what Daniel Pauly said. We want to protect things that are gone. And this is where the planned marine protected areas are. It's taken six years to still plan them. They're still not in place. And unfortunately, the south coast has no marine protected areas. This just doesn't seem right. So after finding that out, I felt like there was more coastlines across the world that could be surveyed. more places we could find out if the marine protected areas were placed in the right spot. So the next phase of my journey takes me here to East Africa. East Africa is doing a great job, especially Mozambique, Tanzania and Kenya especially. There's 17 marine protected areas and many of those are no take. The WWF identified this region as one of the 18 most important bioregions in the world. And the coastal resources here support some 30 million people both in their livelihoods and their local economies. So at the end of this year, a team of scientists, filmmakers and photographers will travel from southern Mozambique to Kenya, collecting data in the marine realm and also on land, the socioeconomic data we need to understand as well, to learn about what's going on in East Africa. This is where my journey is taking me next. I'm thinking big and so should everyone here. I'll never finish my journey, but I'm confident that in time, that we, as, science, we as, a, as a community of passionate and community and committed ocean advocates, scientists and conservationists, we will turn the tide 
on the decline in our fish stocks on our coral reefs. And ultimately, ultimately, we will ensure they'll be around to support the economies and livelihoods for generations to come. And perhaps one day, the fish and sharks will return in the numbers that match my expectations growing up as a kid. Thanks. <laughs>